This is the third of our five student loan webinar series with uh, DFPI and Tesla. Our next one will be in October and it is PSLF. So sign up to our DFPI newsletter, go on our back on track page so you can get information on that um, on that webinar. Uh, let me start with some housekeeping items, your video, microphone, and chat function is disabled. Uh, we do have a Q&A function where you can enter questions. I will be answering questions today. Um, we will try to get to some live answers at the end of the webinar. Um, and then if not, we will get back to you. This event is being recorded um, and you will all be receiving a recording of the webinar and we will be posting it on our DFPI YouTube Californians with Student Loan page as well. So that should be up in a few days. Um, my name is Selena Damien and I am the Student Loan Ombuds person here at the DFPI. Um, part of my work as the Ombuds person is to do education and outreach for Californians with student loans. And today I'm happy to be here today to present or to present on this topic um, with um, Betsy. Um, we know that um, being in default can be financially distressing and challenging. Um, and But the good thing is right now, there are some great opportunities for borrowers to get back on track, get credit restored, and then other options. So but I am here with Betsy Mayot, who is the founder of the Institute of Student Loan Advisors, or TISLA. She has helped, she has been in the student loan industry for over 20 years and, and has helped thousands of borrowers um, across the nation with student loan issues. So she will be talking about um, your options today. Um, so before I hand it over to Betsy, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so today we will be talking about Fresh Start and then other ways to get out of default. Just briefly about DFPI, um, we are California's Consumer Protection Agency. We regulate companies of financial products to ensure compliance, and that includes student loan servicers. Just briefly, for federal student loans, your student loan servicers, it, they are going to be the borrower's main point of contact. So when you call to pay your bill, to find out about your repayment, to when you get your billing statements, try to switch over a repayment plan, you will be talking to your servicer. Um, very important to understand who they are. Um, DFPI also accepts and evalu evaluate consumer complaints against student loan servicers. We take enforcement and legal action when companies are not in compliance. We conduct education and outreach such, such as this one to protect consumers from fraud and abuse. Next one, please. And then yeah, Tesla. already talked about us. Yeah, and then Tesla, of course. Uh, next, please. And then I will hand it over to Betsy to get started on Fresh Start. Thanks, Selena. Um, I, I know we already mentioned this, but we are recording this and the recording will be available on the DFPI website uh, sometime next week at the latest. Uh, we will not be sending it out to you individually. Uh, as far as questions go, we do very much encourage you to ask questions, but a couple sort of ground rules, housekeeping rules for questions. First of all, I ask that you sort of hold off on your questions until I cover the, uh, or Selena covers the topic that your question refers to. If we're doing our job right, we're gonna answer your question along the way. But if we get to that part and, and we haven't answered your question, by all means, post that question into the Q&A panel. Also, every now and then I'm gonna take a breath and ask if there's any questions that might be good for the whole group to hear. And if there are, uh, Selena will let me know and I'm gonna do that for her and her section as well. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention about questions is, <coughs> excuse me, this is public. Um, it is also recorded. So you don't want to be putting a lot of personal information uh, in your questions. I mean, this is your financial situation is your business and nobody else's. So if you do have really detailed questions, uh, my suggestion, uh, you know, detailed questions as far as, you know, that you need to include personal information. My recommendation is that you either reach out via email to DFPI or to TISLA. We both offer free student loan advice and dispute resolution uh, to borrowers. And it's all private, so you don't have to worry about people knowing your business, so to speak. Um, I do see, um, all right, we've got a lot more people logging in, uh, which is great. So with all that housekeeping out of the way, I am gonna get started 
uh, on the Fresh Start program. So um, the first thing I think we need to talk about is defining what default is because the definition of default in a federal student loan is very different than the definition of default in almost every other type of consumer debt. Um, federal student loans are not considered in default um, until they're at least 270 days past due, which is essentially nine months worth of uh, missing payments. So to be clear, the least amount of time it would ever take you to default is nine months, but it could take you longer. Um, if you're in a financial situation where you're able to make the payment some of the time, um, then you're not going to hit 270 days past due for longer than nine months. So, for example, if you were able to make your payment every other month, you wouldn't really hit the, the default and all the consequences of actual default for about a year and a half. Um, now, before you get to 270 days past due, you are going to show delinquent. And delinquency has its own consequences. Uh, delinquency can, uh, well, it will affect your um, credit report. Uh, default does as well, um, but default has a much uh, more, uh, default negatively affects your credit much more significantly than being reported as 90 days past due or 120 days past due and so on. I mean, those are not good things either, but I'm trying to emphasize that the default, having the default line on your credit report is the thing that most negatively impacts your credit. Um, if you're delinquent versus in default, uh, you are still eligible for things like forbearances, lower payment options, such as the income driven plans, um, deferments, forbearances, uh, public service loan forgiveness, all of that. Uh, you're still eligible for those if you're delinquent, but once you hit that 270 day mark, you are no longer eligible for things like the SAVE program, the other income driven repayment plans, deferments, and uh, most forbearances. Now there's really two stages of default. There's the moment you hit day 270, and that's when you lose access to all those benefits such as deferments and the lower payment options. But then with about a month or two after you hit day 270, if you haven't resolved it or brought yourself below 270 days, so now you're looking at like the 300 day, 330 day mark of delinquency, that's when the really bad things happen. That's when the loan gets transferred to a collection agency. And it's at that point that you're susceptible to the really negative aspects of default. Um, now, once the loan does transfer to a collection agency, they give you about 60 days, just sort of a last Hail Mary to try to resolve the default. But if you don't, um, they're going to start garnishing your wages pretty much right away. They'll start the process for federal offset, which at the very least is going to mean any tax refund that you might have coming to you and your spouse uh, will be taken and applied to your student loan. Social Security will be uh, garnished and most other federal payments are also susceptible to garnishment uh, once you're at this stage. Uh, they also can and will add collection costs and those collection costs can be as much as 24% of your loan balance. Um, if you have an old Perkins loan, believe it or not, they can actually add collection costs up to 40% of your loan balance. And that's all written under federal law. Um, once you're in default, as in uh, 270 days or more, you're no longer eligible for any additional federal student aid, such as loans or Pell Grants. So if you're trying to go back to school um, and you need federal aid to do that, you're not going to be able to until you resolve the default. Um, and of course, as I mentioned, a default line is added to your credit report, which is a much more significant ding to your credit than the sort of 90 day past due, 120 day past due. Now, Selena's going to talk about this more uh, afterwards, but one thing you should know is that during what they're calling the on ramp period uh, for people to resume student loan payments, uh, you are not going to be reported to the credit bureaus if you fall behind on your loans during the next six to 12 months. Uh, and you also won't be at risk for default during the next six to 12 months. 
um, but you you will still be past due on your loan um, and interest will still accrue and you will still be due for payments. But as Selena will, show, will, will talk about, you won't actually uh, show delinquent during this, this uh, small on-ramp period. And for those of you that may have been in default uh, prior to COVID and you are still in default, um, you might be saying, well, wait a minute, they haven't garnished my wages, they haven't taken my tax return. Well, that was because the, of the COVID pause. Uh, they stopped uh, in what we call involuntary collections on all federal defaulted loans uh, during the COVID pause. Now that COVID, COVID pause ended uh, on August 31st. <clears throat> and so you're gonna start seeing some of this collection stuff start resuming um, and then be uh, sort of in full by the time the on-ramp period ends. Uh, the last thing I wanna mention about default itself is that there's no statute of limitations on the collection of defaulted federal student loans. Um, for most consumer debt, if um, if certain situations happen where maybe there's no contact uh, with the borrower after a certain number of years, that doesn't mean the borrower doesn't owe the debt. It just means that uh, the whoever is collecting on that debt no longer has the ability to sue or garnish wages or that kind of thing. There is no statute of limitations for federal student loans. I have seen loans that have been in default since the 70s. And those loans are not only collectible, but are just as susceptible to wage garnishment and litigation um, as loans that freshly defaulted in, you know, that might default in 2025, for example. So that's, you know, that's a, sort of a myth that's out there is that if you ignore the loan long enough, there's nothing they can do. And that is not the case when it comes to federal student loans. So thankfully um one of the many waivers that got implemented during the COVID pause is a program called fresh start now fresh start is really an amazing opportunity for borrowers that are in default um, fresh start to oversimplify it essentially means with one phone call uh, no payments necessary you're going to be taken out of default and be back in good standing um, and have the default line removed from your credit report um, I'll explain the process in a little more detail in a second. But this is a, a limited time program. Fresh Start is only going to be available to borrowers for a year after the COVID pause ended, which was August 31st. Now, um, as far as eligibility for Fresh Start goes, if you have a fell loan or a direct loan that defaulted prior to March 13th of 2020, that loan is eligible for Fresh Start. Now, a lot of people aren't clear what a FELL loan is versus a direct loan. FELL and direct loans, that refers to the loan program. They're both federal student loan programs. Um, they both um, existed prior to 2010, um, and the residual FELL loans still exist. They stopped making FELL loans um, uh, on July 1st, 2010, but the ones that they made prior to that still exist. Um, FELL and direct loans, they can be Stafford loans, they can be Graduate Plus loans, they can be consolidations, they can be Parent Plus. So as long as you have a Stafford loan, uh, a Parent Plus, a consolidation, a federal consolidation loan, or a Graduate Plus loan, or even uh, you might have uh, an old, what we called SLS loan. Uh, they stopped making those in 1993. Uh, you could have an old, what we call a FISA loan, F-I-S-L. They stopped making those in the 80s, I think. Those are all eligible for Fresh Start um, if they defaulted prior to March 13th of 2020. Now, if you defaulted after March 13th of 2020, they have or will be taking you out of default anyway uh, without you having to do anything. Um, if you default after basically today, um, then you will not be eligible for the Fresh Start program. The other loans that are eligible for Fresh Start are some limited Perkins loans. The only Perkins defaulted Perkins loans that are eligible for Fresh Start are ones that are actively being held by the Department of Education. Uh, the way to tell if your loan's being held by the Department of Ed is to log on to the Department of Ed's website, which is studentaid.gov, and see who the servicer or lender is. And if it shows Department of Education, 
then your Perkins is eligible for Fresh Start. Most Perkins defaulted included are held by a loan servicer called ECSI. If your Perkins is being managed by ECSI or a law firm, then it is not eligible for Fresh Start. But it is eligible for other options to get out of default that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Loans that are not eligible for Fresh Start include, as I mentioned, Perkins loans held by anybody other than the Department of Education. If you have a federal HEAL loan um, that's in default, I'm afraid it's not eligible. If you have an active lawsuit or judgment against you with the United States Department of Justice on your student loans, those are few and far between, but they exist. Unfortunately, you won't be able to do Fresh Start there either. Um, as I mentioned, any loan that defaults uh, basically from here on forward won't be eligible for Fresh Start. And previously pre-defaulted loans that have already been taken out of default or have been paid in full are also not eligible for Fresh Start. Now here are all the benefits of the Fresh Start program. Uh, number one, it removes the default line from your credit report like it was never there. Um, now, it doesn't remove the delinquencies that led up to the default. So as I mentioned earlier, before you actually hit default, uh, you would be reported to the credit bureau as 90 days delinquent, 120 days delinquent, and so on. Those don't come off as part of Fresh Start. Those have to follow the normal credit reporting rules where they drop off after seven years of being on your report. But the default line, which again is the big whammy, uh, that comes off your credit report like it was never there in the first place uh, if you go through Fresh Start. Fresh Start does not result in any additional collection costs. You'll see with the other options for getting out of default, such as rehabilitation and consolidation, that can result in additional collection costs. Um, there are some defaulted borrowers that have been stuck in default with no options of getting out other than paying the loan in full. Those are direct loan borrowers that just have a single consolidation loan and have already used the loan rehabilitation option before. Uh, those borrowers have historically been stuck in default. They don't have any other options. Uh, these borrowers can use Fresh Start. So if you're someone who tried to get out of default before and were told that you weren't eligible to do that, Fresh Start is something that you're going to be able to pursue. <clears throat> um, the other thing I want to mention about Fresh Start, which is great, is you'll see when we talk about loan rehabilitation that that's a one-time only option. Once you rehab, if you default again, then you can never rehab again. That's not the case for Fresh Start. Fresh Start does not count as your one-time only rehab. Um, and if you've already used rehab, um, it won't, that won't prevent you from utilizing the Fresh Start program. Once you go through Fresh Start, you'll once again be eligible for new Title IV aid, including Pell Grants and new loans. You'll be eligible for PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness. You'll be eligible for the Income Driven Repayment Plans and the other lower payment options, including the new SAVE plan that you might have heard about. Um, and then finally, um, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about it on this session, but we have talked about it in one of our past sessions in this series, and you can find the recording for that on the DFPI website, but your loan would also be eligible for what's being called the one-time account adjustment. Now, if you've been paying on your student loans for a very long time, the one-time account adjustment could end up in resulting in immediate forgiveness for you, uh, or it could get you a lot closer to loan forgiveness. So that's definitely something that you're going to want to check out by reviewing our past webinar on this, or we also have a link to more information about the one time adjustment in the resources uh, that are at the on the last slide of this presentation. Um, before I get into the how to opt into fresh start Selena have you had any questions uh, about anything i've covered so far that you think might be good for the whole group. No, not yet. I think you'll be covering about, um, I do have a question about once the student loan is in collection, can you negotiate the amount of the balance due? But I think you're covering that. Maybe not. Um, 
I I will make sure to cover it. So thank you for thank you Thanks. for flagging that. It's a good question. Yes. Thanks. All right. So here's how you opt into the Fresh Start uh, program. If you're not currently in school, um, well, all you need to do is contact the collection agency that is currently holding your loan. If you don't know who that is, you can find out by logging into studentaid.gov. If you have a direct loan, chances are the loan is being, the collection agency is going to be an organization called DMCS. And you'll see in a minute, I'll tell you how to contact them. Um, if you have an older FELL loan, chances are your loan's either being held by an outright collection agency or an entity called a guarantee agency. Either way, no matter who's holding the loan, you'll be able to find their contact information by logging into studentaid.gov. Um, depending on who you reach out to, they're going to collect some information from you. Um, a good piece of information to have in front of you will be your most recent tax return because as part of the Fresh Start program, they're gonna try to pre-qualify you for a payment plan that fits your budget, hopefully an income-driven repayment plan. So things will go a lot faster for you and you'll have less steps if you already know your adjusted gross income, your most recent adjusted gross income. Uh, but if you don't have it right in front of you, you can still move forward with Fresh Start. You'll just have another step to do later on. Once they do your initial opt-in, which is gonna take less than 10 minutes, if the loan isn't already uh, with DMCS, it's gonna be transferred there. Um, from there, you're going to make actual repayment arrangements if you didn't already do that in step one. And by repayment arrangements, it means picking the payment plan that works best for your budget, whether it be the save plan, another income driven plan, or um, you know perhaps the graduated repayment plan. There's quite a few options available. And the people on the phone with you will help you pick the plan that will work best for you. Um, you can also sort of get an idea ahead of time of what the payments might look like by uh, using what's called the loan simulator tool uh, at studentaid.gov. You just plug in your uh, income information and it'll tell you what your payment will be under all the plans that you're potentially eligible for once you're out of default. Now, once all these steps take place, after about 30 to 60 days, the loan's going to transfer to a servicer called Nelnet. And from there, your loan's going to be out of default and back in good standing. Um, and you won't have to worry about the default line on your credit report. Again, you'll be eligible for deferments, forbearances, lower payment options, public service loan forgiveness, the one-time account adjustment, all of that. Now, if you're in school now or going to be enrolling in school very shortly, the process is a little different. What you do is you fill out the FAFSA, like you wanted to take out, um, you know, to be able to take out new federal student aid. Uh, you're gonna initially be denied, but then your school, uh, you tell if you tell your financial aid office that you're participating or wanna participate in the Fresh Start program, they're gonna have you sign a statement. And I'm gonna show you what that statement says in the next slide. Um, once they collect and sign that statement, you are out of default. They can disperse new federal aid to you, um, and they're going to send your defaulted loans to Nelnet, just like everybody else, and put the loans in an in-school deferment status. So you're not going to be due for any payments while you're in school at least half time. So again, both processes, processes take less than 10 minutes, um, don't require any payments, um, and are really easy to fulfill. Uh, what you have in front of you is the statement if you're in school and going through Fresh Start, this is the statement that the school is going to require you to sign. It's pretty straightforward. It's not a 300 page contract. It's definitely simpler than your master promissory note was and you know, your Apple terms and conditions. So there's actually three different ways to initiate fresh start if you're not in school. The, the process I just talked about was the process by doing it over the phone. Frankly, I think this is the easiest one to do. And especially if you know your AGI ahead of time, the, the fastest and the least amount of steps. But if you don't like to talk to people on the phone, you do have other options. You can do it online by going to myeddebt.ed.gov. 
That's actually the link to uh, DMCS that I mentioned before and log into your account there um, and you'll be able to go through the process that way. Um, if you don't like any of these newfangled phone and internet things, uh, then you can do it by snail mail. And what you do is you utilize the, you send a letter to the PO box that's listed here on this screen. And just make sure that in your letter, you include the statement, uh, I would like to use Fresh Start to bring my loans back into good standing. And from there, someone will reach out to you and you'll be able to do it by mail. <coughs> I want to explain a little bit more about how the credit reporting works for Fresh Start. They actually started reporting all defaulted federal student loans as current um, in 2020 in February of this year. And they're going to continue reporting them as current until the Fresh Start period is over, which again is, is August of 2024. Now, if you use Fresh Start, if you take advantage of this, um, this limited time program, sound like a car salesman or a, a late night TV ad, but it is a limited time program. Um, if you take advantage of it, uh, the defaulted loan trade line will be deleted 100% um, from your credit report like it was never there. And then they'll start a new trade line via Nelnet showing that your loan is in good standing. If you don't use Fresh Start, uh, once the Fresh Start period is over, your loan will once again be reported to collections. Now, there is an exception to that. If you defaulted more than seven years ago, um, they're not going to reinstate the trade line, whether you use the defaulted trade line, whether you use um, the Fresh Start program or not. But they will resume the collections, the wage garnishment, the collection costs, the tax refund offset, and so on. Again, as a reminder, Fresh Start does not remove the delinquencies that led up to the default, uh, but those do also drop off after seven years on their own. Now, as far as the wage garnishment and the tax offset and the social security garnishment goes, the, what we call involuntary collections, they're going to pause involuntary collections until September. So until the fresh start period is over. Um, but if you if someone were to default after basically this month, they're gonna start doing offsets six months. Um, they're gonna start doing offset in June I'm sorry, not in June, in March, um, and they're going to start garnishing your wages right away. So essentially, if a fresh default, so for defaults that aren't eligible for fresh start, they can expect involuntary collections to start right away. But loans that are already in default that are eligible for fresh start, they're going to continue to see a pause on the involuntary collections until next fall. Um, if you happen to default during the COVID pause, uh, but before they stopped collecting on the defaulted loans during the COVID pause, um, they're actually not going to count that one-time rehab against you. So as I mentioned before, normally you can only rehabilitate your loans once, but there's a few people that actually rehabbed during the COVID pause. And if you did that, they're not going to count that as your one-time rehab. I mean, hopefully you don't need another rehab because you're not going to default again. But if life happens and it does happen, you will have the ability to rehab again. Now, if you were in the middle of rehabbing, but never completed during the COVID pause, you again can do fresh start and you won't have to make any additional payments. So let's talk about the other ways out of default. Minus the fresh start program, which remember fresh start is limited. Uh, and once it's gone, it's gone. They're never going to bring it back. You really only have three ways of getting out of default. One is to pay the loan in full. And for the vast majority of people, if you could afford to pay the loan in full, you wouldn't have defaulted in the first place. So let's put that one aside. Um, actually, no, before we put that aside, let's address the question, the earlier question. I get this a lot. Uh, can you negotiate a settlement with federal student loans? And the answer is yes and no. Um, you can't uh, settle a student loan like you can settle many other defaulted consumer debts, where oftentimes you can pay less than half of what you owe uh, in often cases to settle the loan. Federal student loans are considered the property of the U.S. taxpayer, and the Department of Education has a fiduciary duty 
that's assigned to them under law by Congress to make the federal taxpayer whole. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that you're not going to be able to settle for the most part. If you're able to pay the whole balance off in one fell swoop, um, then they will sometimes reduce the amount of collection costs that you owe. Um, but it's not going to be uh, less than what you borrowed, and it's not going to be less than the amount that defaulted in the first place. So, um, you know, I've run into bar a couple borrowers in my long career that have decided to what they considered a strategically default, figuring that once they defaulted, um, and for whatever reason they didn't care so much about their credit, once they defaulted that they would be able to settle for half or less than half or pennies on the dollar for what they owed on their student loan. And they were in for a really nasty surprise because for the reasons I explained, federal student loans can't do that. At best, they'll reduce or eliminate the collection costs if you can pay it off in one fell swoop, but you don't know the collection costs in the first place if you don't default. So strategic defaulting is not a good strategy for federal student loans. Now, the other two ways of getting out of default outside of the Fresh Start program, uh, one is loan rehabilitation. Loan rehabilitation has a lot of the benefits of Fresh Start, uh, but it does require payment and it does take a much longer period of time. Fresh Start's only gonna take you 30 to 60 days. Um, for loan rehab, what you do is you make nine consecutive on-time payments. Um, on-time is defined as within 20 days of the due date, which is why Technically, you can make those nine payments over a 10 month period. They're going to set your payment based on your income. Uh, generally, they're using 10 or 15% of your discretionary income. If that payment's too high for you, you can submit a form that includes uh, your expenses and they will, they might be able to reduce the rehab payment further. I want to caution you about that, however. This is the only scenario when you're working with federal student loans where they will actually take your actual expenses into account. If you can't afford the rehab payment that they give you that's based on your income, you might wanna reconsider uh, getting on a default for the moment. Because if you can't afford that payment, chances are you might not be able to afford any of the payment plans once you're out of default which would mean you default a second time and you'd get a second round of collection costs. While I do encourage almost everybody to get out of default because of all the benefits um, and the improvement to your credit, there are some people that are better off staying in default for at least a little while until they can be sure there's a payment plan that they can afford once they're out of default. Because the only thing worse than being in default is defaulting more than once. Um, and having double or even triple collection costs. Um, and again, what you can only rehab once. So if you def go through rehab and default a second time, you're not going to have that option available to you. Um, so again, while you do have the option of having them use your expenses to calculate your rehab payment, it might not be a good idea for the reasons I explained. Once you start the loan rehab process, if your wages are being garnished, uh, they will stop after the fifth payment, but if you miss a payment after that, they'll go back to garnishing your wages right away and they won't stop until the loan's either paid off or you're completely out of default. Uh, you become eligible for new student loans and other federal aid after payment six, uh, but once you hit payment nine, that's when they completely take you out of default. You become eligible for all the lower payment options and all those other fun things. Um, they remove the default line from your credit report, just like Fresh Start does, and it reduces your collection costs. So rather than having as much as 24% in collection costs, it reduces your collection costs to 16%, which isn't as good as Fresh Start, where there's no additional collection costs, but it's still better. It's still a better option than most. Um, unless you previously rehabbed prior to August of 2008, you're only allowed to use rehabilitation once per loan. Um, and again, Fresh Start does not count uh, towards a rehab attempt. The other way out of default is to consolidate your loans. Um, sometimes they do require one or two or maybe even three payments uh, to show good faith before they'll let the loan consolidate. But just as, just as often, 
um, they'll just let the loan out to be able to consolidate. Now, consolidation will put your loan back in good standing. You'll be eligible for save and PSLF and the one-time adjustment and all those other goodies. Um, but it will not remove the default line from your credit report. Now, it will show on your credit that you've resolved the default and that the loan is back in good standing, but it will still show that at one point the loan was in default, which isn't the case for rehab or a fresh start program. Consolidation also reduces your collection costs uh, down to 18.5%. Um, and, you know, if you have multiple loans, you can consolidate as many times as you default. But again, hopefully you never default again after um, running into that hardship that first time. The other thing I want to mention about consolidation is that if you have a direct loan and you're under wage garnishment, they oftentimes will not release the loan for consolidation. You can try to negotiate it <coughs> and see if they will, but they might only allow you to use rehab. And if you've already used your rehab, you might be stuck in default until the loan is paid in full. So if you've tried, again, if you've tried to get out of default in the past and were told you couldn't, you're, you're, that, that might be the scenario that you're in. So Fresh Start is definitely going to be your last chance to try to get the loan out of default. I see someone raise their hand. Um, we have kind of a big enough crowd today that we're not going to do verbal questions. So if you have questions with the raised hand, I, um, I strongly suggest that you add them to the Q&A panel to make sure that we get to them. All right, so uh, Selena, I've talked about Fresh Start and the other ways out of default. Before I sort of do the last bits of new things that are affecting defaulted borrowers, were there any other questions about what I've covered that you think might be good for the whole group? No, I haven't seen anything. You've answered, um, you've answered everything. Oh, good. So okay. So the last couple of things I wanted to talk about regarding defaulted loans before I, I move over to our superstar Selena um, is IBR. So there's a new regulation that took effect, that's going to take effect next July. And under that new regulation, borrowers that are in default will actually be able to uh, access one of the income driven plans. Now, not the save plan. The save plan is the one you've probably been hearing about lately. That is tends to be the most generous plan, but a defaulted borrowers will be able to get on what's called income based repayment. Now, um, that be that'll be 10 percent of your discretionary income, and that's based on your family size and state. Um, it's not going to be getting on IBR is not going to stop any involuntary collections, but it can be used in some cases towards loan rehabilitation and even better, those payments that you make under IBR on the defaulted loan will count towards loan forgiveness. So one of the things about the income driven plans, including IBR and including the safe plan is that if you are on those plans for either 20 or 25 years, if you still have a balance, they're going to forgive the balance. Now, historically, any payments, any time you spend in default, whether you're making payments or not, does not count towards that forgiveness timeline. But starting July 1st of 2024, if you're in default and get an IBR, uh, it will count towards the 2025 years you need to uh, the period that you're on IBR will count uh, towards the 2025 years you need for forgiveness. Now, I don't want you to misconstrue this. This is, does not mean that being in default means that you're all of a sudden eligible for all the things and that there's no benefit to getting out of default. That's not true at all. Uh, you're still going to get collection costs. You're still going to get your wages garnished. You're still going to show as default on your credit report unless you rehab or consolidate out of default, or if before the deadline comes, you utilize the Fresh Start program. The only thing this new reg really does is allow defaulted borrowers for at least a little bit of time to have that period count uh, towards loan forgiveness. All right, and with that, and Selena, unless there's other questions, Let's uh, let's bring you up to the virtual podium and I'll go sit down at 
the virtual computer to take over for the Q and A's. Yeah, there's a few on their left. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few things right now. So I hope that answers some of the questions. So there weren't too many, but there were just some people asking what's AGI, adjusted gross income and IBR income based repayment plans. So I did answer those in the chat. And for those others that were wondering, sometimes we just um, assume people know what we're talking about, but we use a lot of acronyms. So, <laughs> all right, uh, next. So we're gonna, I'm gonna be talking about return to repayment. Um, now that Betsy covered some of the, the, what options you have for default loans, I want to just take some time and tell you how some tips on preparing because we are starting repayment October 1st for all others that are on not on default. Maybe you have um, you know other loans or maybe you your children have regular loans that are in good standing, but repayment starting in October. So next slide, please. So yes, student loan interest resumed on the loans on September 1st. Okay, so no more extensions for the repayment. Um, some of the options that were announced um, by Department of Education for those that um, are having trouble, will be having trouble getting back into, you know, adding a new bill to their budget, um, just maybe their new borrowers who graduated during the pandemic and they don't even know where to like how they're going to get started so um they did announce a a new payment plan which is the saving on a valuable education plan so repayment options can be very confusing for people but just keep in mind so there's three traditional payment plans for borrowers okay when a borrower graduates from school they're automatically automatically placed on the standard repayment plan then you have your four income driven repayment plans. So a borrower, if they have a direct loan, they have the option of pretty much a newer direct loan, they have pretty much the option of getting on any of the income driven repayment plans. Some of the older loans don't have um, access to all the IDR plans, nor do parent plus loans. But if you have a direct loan, you, you have access to the income driven repayment plans. The newest income driven payment plan that was announced is the save is the save plan. OK, it's replacing the existing revised as you pay plan, the repay plan. So anyone that's on a repay plan is going to automatically be, be switched over to the save plan. Now, what's so good about these this new plan and three of the critical benefits that have already been implemented or starting October 1st, um, is that it increases the income exemption from 150 to 225 percent of the poverty line. So when you're on an income driven repayment plan, they base your payment on your income. So what they're doing is they're increasing the amount of the protected income in their calculation so that your payment is lower. So a borrower that makes, I believe, uh, 32, under 32,800 a year will have a zero dollar payment regardless of their balance. So that's so basically what they're saying about a thousand dollars a month a year in savings for borrowers. Um, and then another really important benefit that's happening with this payment plan is that the department will start charge stop charging any monthly interest not covered by the borrower's payment. Typically under income driven repayment plans, if the payment that you are assigned or that you have to pay doesn't cover the interest of your balance, it gets that interest gets added on top of your total balance, therefore increasing the balance of your loan, of your total loan. Under the SAVE plan, the department will be covering that interest. Another benefit is that married borrowers who file their taxes separately will no longer be required to include their spouse's income and then in their calculation and then remain, remaining benefits will be implemented July of 2024, which will include, I believe, um, five undergrad loans, 5% that will drop down to 5%, the actual payment. Um, and then there will be a new forgiveness plan that will be a component of the save plan where if you borrow 12,000 or less, after 10 years of making a payment, you will be um, uh, granted forgiveness. And then there's also new uh, regs on the IDR plans as far as certification. So now you can actually check to when you're applying for these income-driven repayment plans, they can transfer that 
IRS information automatically where you don't have to recertify manually every year. So take a, write this link down, take a look at the link, read the information thoroughly. I'm getting a lot of questions. The SAVE plan is just an income-driven repayment plan. So it doesn't, it's not the same as, it's not a requirement of PSLF. It's not a requirement of Fresh Start. It's not a requirement for any of these programs. It is just one of the four IDR plans and it's being called one of the most affordable. So I would um, encourage everyone to, do check the FSA, the simulator. I put the link in the chat to see what payments would be under those plans. So explore your, it's actually right there, explore your repayment options and then the on-ramp program. So this is a program that they've also announced um, from October 1st, the start of repayment through September 30th of next year. Any missed partial or late payments will not lead to negative credit reporting default or loans being sent to collections. So if for some reason you need a few extra months to get adjusted, you're not able to get on the plan that you want, there won't be any negative credit reporting on your uh, credit report. The only thing is that the on-ramp program, you will be accruing interest, you will, and these missed payments or these months will not count towards your eligibility for other forgiveness programs like PSLF and the income driven repayment plan. So I would encourage you to check your options, look at your, check the, use the loan simulator, and then look at the information on the save plan. So the save plan is already available. It's one of the IDR plans. And I have to stress it because people get really confused and these questions are coming in constantly about, you know, what it is really. So it's just one of the four IDR plans, the newest one. So check it out. Uh, the next, next slide, please. And then, so just really important tips. Lots of changes have taken place since the start of the pandemic, of the pause, including millions of servicer transfers. As I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, your servicer is going to, is your main point of contact. That's going to be your um, Fed loan that's no longer in business um, or no longer servicing federal loans. Now you're going to have your Nelnet, you're going to have your Advantage. So there were a lot, millions of borrowers had their servicers transferred. So if you go on to, I've had borrowers that are calling the old number or they're going on and they're saying, now I have a different a different servicer. What happened is, can this be real? Is this, is this correct? Um, you know, did someone take my loan? No, it was done by the Department of Education. Those transfers were done automatically. A borrower needs to go on studentaid.gov to check to see who their servicer is. So studentaid.gov is gonna be your main portal. You're gonna have your loan balance, your loan information. You're gonna have your loan servicer information and a link directly to your servicer. So you should have your studentaid.gov account and your servicer account, okay? You're gonna have two different portals, but to confirm who your servicer is, it's gonna be that studentaid.gov. As I said, you need to, You'll find your information, your type balance and servicer. If you want help from um, either myself or Betsy, if you're reaching out, if you really want, to, we're gonna need to know who, what type of loan you have, right? So it's gonna be very important that you have that information. Update your contact information. A lot could have changed within these last three years. So you're gonna update them with both your servicer and your student studentaid.gov. Read all communications that you receive. I've had some borrowers that are logging in and they're like, my balance is zero. My balance is zero. What happened? Well, they received PSLF or another type of discharge months ago and there was a notice in the servicer uh, mailbox. So there, no one is checking. So make sure that you read the communications. They're very important. Your bills will be mailed out with your payment amount and due date at least 21 days before your due date. That means that some may have already been starting to go out. You will need to enroll or re-enroll in auto pay. So if you were enrolled in auto pay prior to the pandemic, prior to the payment pause, then you will need to re-enroll. You do save. Uh, there is a 0.25% savings on your interest or discount on your interest rate if you do um, auto pay. Uh, studentaid.gov has information, pretty much everything that I've discussed right now about how to prepare, but just very important, know your loan, your balance, and your servicer, make sure you're checking your, your account, make sure everything transferred accordingly, make sure you get yourself on the 
uh, the appropriate um, repayment plan, the one that's best for you and for your financial situation and your goal. And then Betsy provided all this information for borrowers that are in default, a little bit different process, but also great information. And those links I've included in the chat. Next, please. Before also we go, student loan scam. So the scammers are hot right now. They know there's a lot of confusion. They know repayment is starting. Um, some of these are not even scammers. They're just de like debt relief companies. With the, if you get an email, if you get are getting constant phone calls from someone saying you need to pay now, you need to act now, you need to consolidate now, you're gonna miss out. This is urgent. Uh, do something now, then. I would be wary, be wary of that, okay? You can get the number. You can, if you get a letter in the mail, sometimes they're sending letters and they're very official looking logos. I would look up the company. You can look up on Google and you'll find out in the within the within on the first page whether they're legit or not. One thing to know is that loan servicers and the federal government, they're not calling borrowers on the phone. They barely have time to answer their own phones, unfortunately. Verify the information, never give out your login information or their password. Sometimes these companies are even buying information. So they'll call you and they'll, they'll tell, they'll know how much loan you have, which will make it even more um, official, legit sounding. So if they're calling you, no, thank you. I'll call back. You go in and you go on your student aid portal or your service portal and you see what information is on there, any communication. Um, but the deadline, really, the most important deadline right now that you need to know is that October 1st is start of repayment. Save, there's no uh, expiration date for save. PSLF is still the public service loan forgiveness. It's still in place. There's nothing that's, I think, disappearing immediately. So if you all these benefits, they're in place. The Department of Education knows that there's a lot of changes going on. Everything is on their website, too. And then you have other nonprofits, you have a uh, California Consumer Pre Protection Agency like ourselves helping borrowers. If you've been a victim, um, you can file a complaint with us or with the FTC. They are really ramping up also their efforts because these uh, scammers are coming hard at borrowers. So we really want everyone to be protected. Next, please. Actually, before I give you oh. the next, I just want to reemphasize yeah. this messaging. Just yesterday, I had a borrower who had reached out to Tisla um, and they had a company reach out to them via, via phone and they called themselves federal student aid uh, <coughs> and they offered to help the borrower with their defaulted loan, the Fresh Start program for 300 bucks. Um, and they almost fell for it. Um, yeah. So there is no fee for a Fresh Start. So if anyone tells you there's a fee for Fresh Start or for the save plan or uh, there's never a fee to utilize any of the federal student loan benefits, whether they be lower payment options or forgiveness. And paying someone a fee isn't gonna get you that benefit any faster anyway. So thankfully we were able to save this borrower before they paid that $300. Oh, um, yeah, I've talked to many borrowers as well. I had one paying through the whole COVID pause an elderly borrower was paying $80 a month when she shouldn't have been paying. And the money turns out was going to an overseas call center. So. Um, yeah, no, they're they're really, yeah, they're stealing, defrauding, stealing people's monies and identity. So please be very careful. One thing I do want everyone to keep in mind are the protections that are afforded to California borrowers, in addition to the federal ones that are afforded through the federal government. But uh, through the Bill of Rights, California borrowers have um, rights, whether they have federal or private loans. And what these rights do, protections, is that it prohibits servicers from engaging in abusive, unfair, or deceptive practices, and they require that they work in your best interest. So when you call your servicer, they have to provide you with the correct information, applications for IDR plans, and other forms. It does establish special protections for military borrowers, those working in public service, older borrowers, and those with disabilities. And it protects borrowers from any negative consequences stemming from a sale, assignment, or transfer. Now, this is really important right now with all these transfers that I talked about. Make sure that you are checking your account balances from there weren't any transfers. Make sure that it's just look at the balance. Make sure there's no discrepancies. And a borrower can file a complaint with us with the DFPI, and we can help facilitate communication because they do have to answer you within a certain amount of time. So if you have a question, if you call, then they 
there was a discrepancy with your save amount, IDR amount information they gave you. You don't get a PSLF count. You're still waiting. You can file a complaint against your servicer through us. Next uh, one, I believe that's the last one for me. These are the resources, all the links. I provided some in the chat as well. But as I said, um, studentaid.gov is going to be your main portal. There's TISLA's information as well, where you can go ahead and contact them if you have any questions on deferment, forbearance, on default, anything that we talked about today. Um, our YouTube page, all the webinars that we've done so far are on our YouTube page. So um, we just had one last month on preparing for repayment where we delve deep into the IDR plan. So we talked about the save plan, how those calculations, uh, well, Betsy did. I don't want to take credit for that. But that's really one that's really uh, helpful right now for borrowers that are getting back into repayment as well. So check out our YouTube channel, our back on track page, and just stay in touch. Make sure you know who your servicer and your uh, studentaid.gov uh, bookmark that page for everything. <laughs> Betsy? Um, somebody asked that you repeat the uh, awesome information you gave about ACH payments. Oh, okay, yeah. So automatic pay. So you can set up automatic payment through your servicer portal. So that's going to be through your Mojila, your Nelnet. Um, you go ahead and set that up. You do get a 0.25% discount on your interest if you set those monthly um, automatic payments. So if you were on them prior to the pandemic, you're going to have to re-enroll. And if you're a new borrower, then go ahead and um, log on and, and get strain, you know, get us signed up in the, in their portal. Selena, for help, help my, help my mushy head. Uh, someone's asking about a recording for the, for our PSLF webinar. Did we do PSLF yet? Or is that coming? No, we're doing that next month. So that one is going, that one is, it's going to be the third. We're doing them the second Wednesdays of the month. So PSLF is going to be a really good one. So get on our, um, and it's going to be on our back on track page, the registration link on our webinar page. And then um, if they sign up to our, our page, but I can look at the date right now, if you give me two seconds, because we have two minutes. <laughs> yeah. And, and for those people PSLF. asking how to contact us directly, those links in front of you. Um, if you want to reach out, if you need further help and you want to reach out to Selena, uh, you use the contact information on, uh, the DFPI page. If you need additional help and you want it from my organization, you just go to freestudentloanadvice.org and go to the contact page. Yeah, the next one, October 18th, is going to be understanding the public service loan forgiveness. So yeah, definitely sign up for that. Tell all your friends. And that that recording, of course, once it's done, that, of course, will also be posted. Yeah. So someone's asking if we do consulting work for defaulted loans. Um, no, both of us are here because we don't think anyone should have to pay for student loan help, but we do both give one-on-one -on -one advice, including for defaulted loans. So once again, I recommend if you need help that you reach out to us through the websites that I just uh, explained. Um, for people that signed in late, the recording of this. Oh, sorry, I just sent her the YouTube page so she can, the, it will be posted on this uh, webinar will be posted on the YouTube page within by the end of by two, what it Wednesday by the end of the week. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're at time. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. I know it's a lot of information, but we're glad that you're taking the steps to be here and get yourself back on track. And please join us for our next one. Uh, reach out and uh, yeah, just uh, let's get. Uh, thank you for thank you for being here and thank you Betsy for joining me today. Thank you, Selena. Uh, and thank, thanks, everybody. I'm going to stop the recording.